And we are looking forward to this brand new series of sermons, as you see it behind me, called Ready. And uh, looking forward to finding out our hope in Jesus Christ. Be always ready to express our hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And one of the ways we can do that is by recognizing the fact that he is risen from the dead and just celebrating that and having confidence in that fact. So this morning, stand up and let's worship together. Jesus is risen from the dead. Because he is alive, I'm alive as well. We sing that today. I believe in the sun, I believe in the risen one. I believe in the sun. I believe in the risen one. I believe I overcome. I the power of his love. Sing Amen. Amen. As I was thinking about great songs to sing, celebrating Christ's resurrection, of course, all the songs from Easter come to mind. And then I realized there's a song we, as far as I know, I've never sung this song other than Easter Sunday. So today is the day we're going to sing this song outside of Easter Sunday. Christ the Lord is risen today. Sing it out with us.
about the resurrection. Jesus overcame the grave. Christ, through God, conquered the grave. Sing with the ladies as they lead us this morning. Yeah. 
in the grave. Good morning and welcome to First Christian Church. It is so good to be together this morning. And we'd like to make especially welcome our first-time visitors or if you're a visitor here today. As you came in the doors, you should have received a connections card. If you will tear off the bottom of that and fill that out, drop that in the offering plate for us. If you are a first-time guest, if you will hold on to that and at the end of the service, walk that down the stairs and we have a special gift for you at the visitor's kiosk. As Mike said earlier, we're beginning a new sermon series today called Ready. So let us ready ourselves today as we continue to worship. We sang a new song for you last week called about the wonder of Jesus Christ, the wonder of God, and the wonder of life in Christ as we came out of that, that uh, watery grave living for him. If you pick up on it today, sing right along with us. Have you ever seen the wonder? seen the wonder in the glimmer of first sight as the eyes began to open and the blindness meets the light if you have so said I see the world in light I see the world in wonder And God, let's sing with this again.
called Jesus Way, the Gospel Way. Another one of the songs that we shared at Easter time just talked about the resurrection, the power of the resurrection. We invite you to stand. Let's stand and sing. He had the last word. Remember that wonderful white cross that we raised. And we had testimonies of folks whose lives were changed by the power of Jesus Christ. As storms come into our lives, Jesus has the power to save and to make us better. Sing with us. The storm rises from the deep and rages around me. But I will remember when doubts pour within my heart, the battle almost lost. I will.
just a few minutes, we're going to have an opportunity to bring our offerings to the Lord. And I would ask that you would use that time to, you were mentioned earlier, Dawn mentioned the connections card. If you would fill that out, drop that in the offering plate. Or again, if you're a visitor, drop it off at the connections kiosk. We are getting very excited about fall here at First Christian, and it's not just because it's football season, although that's very exciting. Um, But we are launching a new sermon series called Surprise the World. And this sermon series is about some simple habits that we can adopt as Christians to make us highly missional people. And so you're going to have an opportunity to get the book and the curriculum that goes along with this. And this is an alignment series, which means not only on the weekends are we going to be doing Surprise the World at our services. Groups across FCC are going to be doing this study, Surprise the World. And it just so happens that it is Connect Sunday. So when you came in this morning, you should have been given an FCC groups catalog. If you did not, we would like to get one to you. But please look through that. Find a group that would help you connect here at FCC. And if you find a group, there is a groups card on the back of the pew in front of you. If you would fill that out and drop that in the offering plate as well. Guests, as we come to this time of offering, we want you to know that you don't need to feel any obligation to give. But we who call First Christian our home, this is a time of worship for us. And we give out of sacrifice and out of thanksgiving. So let me pray for our offering. Dear Lord, we pray that you will bless this offering. We pray that you will bless these tithes to do great things in this church, great things in this community. We thank you that we can be a part of something so wonderful. It's in your name that we pray. It's in your name that we give. Amen. As they collect the offering, I'd like to mention a couple things that are in your bulletin. If you are a person who hangs out with people, which is most of us, then you are an influencer. And if you influence others, then we believe that the Global Leadership Summit going on this week on Thursday and Friday here at FCC is for you. You have an opportunity to get world-class leadership training this week. There is still time to sign up. You can do that at the GLS kiosk in the atrium. You can also do that online, so consider that. Also, if you would like to be some part of something as wonderful as building a home for a family, won't you consider being a part of the Habitat Community Build? This is a wonderful opportunity, and it begins on August 17th. A couple ways that you can be involved. You can be a part of the building or preparing food or delivering that to the builders, or you can begin to pray for this exciting opportunity for some wonderful family in our community. Um, You can stop by the outreach kiosk in the atrium as well to find out more information about that. Like I said, we've got lots of things going on this fall, so look over your bulletin and the vision news to keep up to date on all of these things. But right now, we're going to turn our hearts and our minds toward communion. Christ alone is our hope. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest trial and storm. What heights of Good morning to you all. Good morning. That was a good one. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes it's like you are getting into the graveyard when you are going into a church, but not so with this church. Thank you. Um, talking about bread and wine, uh, I shared earlier on that um, one of 
my huge surprises when I came to the States was uh, the tons of things that you find on assortment when you want to go and buy. And uh, for us, it was bread. Uh, went into the grocery, and there was so much bread to choose from. And I was not familiar with these breads. They were different from our own breads. And so week in, week out, I would try this bread, take it home, the kids would complain. Try that loaf, the kids would complain. And uh, ultimately, ultimately, we settled for French bread, Italian bread, which is close to the bread from our country. And um, the other time, uh, I was saying this to, to my wife. And of course, this was uh, after I had uh, read this article, followed it up on YouTube, containing one. And so my wife is in the habit of waking up uh, every morning to walk quite early. And uh, I only managed to join her half the time. <laughs> and uh, so one morning she says, hey, you need to wake up. You complain about your weight. Uh, you have to deal with this. You really need to wake up. And so I said, huh, recalling that story. I said, hey, you know, I think I know how to get around this. We need to buy French wine. There is this article going out to say, uh, French wine helps you to lose weight. So I won't have <laughs> to walk in the morning, walk up early, do the hard work. I'll have it easy with wine, French wine. <laughs> and uh, let's go back 2,000 years ago. We have the story of Jesus in John chapter 6 uh, with his many followers. Some of them skeptics, some of them believers. And uh, in uh, chapter 6 of John 6, verse 51, this is what Christ said to them. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed amongst themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink of his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life. And I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread bread will live forever. And so we have this privilege every Sunday to focus centrally on this table. And so this bread and this one represents the bread from heaven. We ought to believe this is the bread from heaven. The bread for which Christ says if we eat, we never die. I struggle, oftentimes, because I have unsettled sin or a weakness, and I have seen my <coughs> friends limp. Sometimes it's not visible because it's not a physical limping. It's an inner limping, carrying that brokenness, carrying even the shame to call yourself a Christian because you are not sure you are living right. And this is the place where it can be settled. The bread of heaven. Shall we pray? Father, we, we thank you that we have the opportunity to believe in your true word that you are delivering to us now the bread from heaven, representing your body and your blood. 
This is not the bread from, from Italy or France. This is not French wine. This is your blood. Father, as we receive it, we do so in faith. Lift the burdens that pertain to us. Give us the freedom we so much seek. And help us to live forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey friends, good to be with you. My name is Ethan Magnus. I am one of the pastors here at First Christian Church and thrilled to be with you as we are kicking off our new series, Ready. Uh, before I do that, I want to make sure you heard the word about our coming series, Surprise the World. It's going to be a little different around here. We are hoping that everybody from kids all the way through our adult groups is getting in connected in that, not just on the weekends, but through the book and the curriculum guide we prepared. So I hope you will. Sorry, I'm a little out of breath. I just ran upstairs. Um, I hope you will pick one of those up as you leave the church today. If you're able to make a $5 donation to cover those costs, that would be great. But that's next. This week, we're talking about ready. Our message is rooted in that text from 1 Peter where he says, always be ready to give an account, give an answer to everyone who asks you of the hope that is within you. And I think for a lot of us, the task of being ready to do such a thing can be a little bit intimidating uh, because we, we, we maybe sort of know why we're hopeful. We, we, have a, we have a sense of why we believe. But to give such an answer, I, I, it's like this. I was uh, biking yesterday with my son, Evan. We, uh, he, he wanted to take me up to show me the mountain biking trails up at Wing Deer Park. And I'd never biked on those trails before, and he had. Uh, so he went first, uh, which is good because he's faster than I am anyway. But uh, he went first, and, 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 and every turn we came to that was hard turn, he would holler out, turn. When we came to a rocky section, he would holler out rocks. If there was a little thing you had to kind of hop over, he would holler out jump. If there was a big dip, he would holler out dip or whatever. He, he made sure that I was ready. 
Because when you face something challenging, if you aren't ready, you will wreck. Now, to be honest, I still wrecked plenty of times yesterday riding with my son, but I wrecked less because he tried to make sure I was ready. And that's what we're trying to do in this series right now. Before I get started, I got a little bit of a book plug. Um, a lot of the ideas from this week and next week, uh, you can also encounter through this book, The Reason for God by Tim Keller. We usually keep about 20 copies of this down in the library for people um, to keep or to borrow. Uh, so if you ever want to check this out, that's fine. We don't keep copies of another book that was really helpful in the preparation of this sermon, which is called, excuse me, The Resurrection of the Son of God. It's by N.T. Wright, The Resurrection of the Son of God. So if I get into this and you're like, wow, I want to know what is the 400-page version of this sermon, go check out that book. It is a masterpiece, The Resurrection of the Son of God by N.T. Wright. All right, so the question we're trying to examine as we try to get ready to give an answer is this question, did Jesus rise from the dead? And this question is, for Christians, the vital question. Uh, Paul puts it this way, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Uh, down in verse 19, he says, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we of all people are most to be pitied. If Christ rose from the dead, Christianity stands. If Christ did not rise from the dead, Christianity falls. Let's not waste our time trying to save, oh, it's still nice to love your neighbor and we still should be, no, no, no. Let's just forget it. Really, I mean, without Jesus Christ risen from the dead, we'd be all much better off being Buddhists. You know, if what, if what Christianity is, is a moral theory, go be Buddhists. It's a great moral theory. Christianity is a conviction that in history something happened, namely the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and we've got to admit that once you have built your religion around a historical event, that does two things. One, it makes it different from every other world religion. Every other world religion is built around theological testimony. Muhammad went into a cave, met Gabriel, came out, and said things that were true about God, that he thinks were true about God. If you believe what Muhammad said about God, then you're a Muslim. If you don't believe it, you're not. But the center of the faith is theological testimony. The same thing is true of Mormonism and Buddhism and Confucianism and Hinduism. The center of the faith is theological testimony. And while we do appreciate how the importance of theological testimony in the Christian church that is not the center of our faith. The center of our faith is a historical event that either happened or it didn't. The other thing that means, though, it doesn't just mean we're different from every other religion. It also introduces a very unique way to talk about our faith. We can talk about our faith in terms of history. We can talk about the reasonableness of our faith, the evidence of our faith, we don't have to say things like, well, you either believe it or you don't. The Bible doesn't talk about our faith like that. Luke says this. He says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been filled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the Lord. Now, so far, he's saying, lots of people have tried to write down what we're just supposed to believe. But listen to what he says next. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I decided to write a book too. He doesn't say you either you believe it or you don't. In fact, he says, I decided I needed to investigate. That is the mark of a historic faith, a faith that is rooted in history where things either happened or they didn't. It's very unique about the Christian faith. Uh, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, he says, what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me as one abnormally born. Paul here is inviting the skeptic and the doubter to enter the conversation of faith. 
He says, what I received, I passed on to you. If Christianity was meant to just be taken on faith, he would say, what I received, I passed on to you, take it or leave it. But he doesn't. He says, what I received, I passed on to you. Christ was died, buried, and then risen. And then he tells them, you can go ask this person or this person or this person. He's so bold as to say, I know of 500 people who saw him alive. This is the invitation of the Christian faith. It is the invitation to the skeptic to examine the evidence. Now, history, of course, cannot be proven like things in a laboratory. But there are historical facts on which everyone agrees. And these historical facts demand an explanation. Uh, Keller has this remark. He says, he says, if you were to say, I can't believe in Christianity because I just don't believe in miracles. People just don't come back from the dead. He says, I get that. I'm sympathetic with that. I struggle to believe in miracles too. He says, but still, you're not let off the hook because there are historical realities that you have to explain somehow. And if you don't think the resurrection is the correct explanation, well, then what's your explanation? So what I want to do, this is a little different than most of my preaching, I just want to systematically go through a very short list. It might not feel short to you. I apologize if it feels long. But I promise you, with comparison with the, the scope of lists that the full scholarship would allow us to do, this is a very short list of things that happened. Things that every historian agrees happened in the first century. And then we're going to talk briefly about what could explain these things that happened. All right, first thing that happened is sometime in the, fourth, in the first century, during a roughly 15 to possibly 20-year period, a new philosophical worldview just emerged into being out of nowhere. A philosophical worldview that was centered utterly on the claim that a particular man rose from the dead. No such claim had ever been made before. No such philosophical, no, or no, no claims like that had been made before, but no philosophical worldview had ever been built on a resurrection ever before. You know, you would see a resurrection story here and there in the middle of some Greek myth or something, but it wasn't the center of the story. But all of a sudden, out of nowhere, such a philosophical worldview didn't emerge. This worldview was repugnant to Jews because though they believed in the resurrection, they thought it was going to come at the end of time after the, resurrection of the restoration of the, the nation of Israel. And this worldview specifically claimed that the resurrection happened in history to just one man. This idea was repugnant to the Greeks because they thought the body was a tomb and that the, the best thing God could do for us is let us become pure spirit. So the very idea of resurrection was noxious to them. And yet, in a very short period of time, this worldview emerged, this new philosophical perspective emerged that was universally, in every one of its expressions, centered on this one bizarre claim that a man rose from the dead. Uh, N.T. Wright reflects that it is without parallel for a new worldview to emerge and become accepted as true in, within one generation. Usually what happens is new ideas emerge, they get taught to a couple generations, and the third or fourth generation accepts these new ideas as a given. You know, if, you know, if, you're, if you're older here, you try and talk to your grandkids and think how differently you see the world, that's the way worldviews happen. Over 50 years, perspectives on the world change. But that's not what happened here. Inside of one generation, people who had never talked about centering their life on the resurrection of one man, all of a sudden, hundreds and thousands of them did. And everybody agrees that happened. And had, I mean, why? How? How did such a new idea just emerge and catch on so fast? Second thing that everybody agrees happened, it's a lot like the first thing, but it's different, is that this new worldview spread into a new religion all over the Roman Empire. It spread west to Rome and east to Persia and north up through what is now Russia, south down to Ethiopia. It said west, spread west in a totally different direction along North Africa, south of the Mediterranean. 
It spread everywhere, this new worldview. And yet, it spread without military power or a charismatic leader or a racial group that it was attached to. And, and never before or since in world history has a religion spread without those, one of those three things. Uh, so, military support. We have lots of stories of religions where a military leader, one person became convinced of a new philosophy, and then they used the power of the sword to spread that philosophy. Islam in its early days mainly spread by the power of the sword. We have lots of examples like that. We have ex lots of examples where a charismatic leader, through their charm and power, convinced lots of people to believe what they believe. We even have modern examples, people like Jim Jones, that kind of thing, where a charismatic leader can get, it, get thousands of people to follow them. We have lots of examples where a, a racial group had a particular religious belief, and as that racial group spread, it carried those ideas with them, and they kind of caught on everywhere it went. But there's no other example of a religion spreading like Christianity without one of those things to move it forward and cause it to spread. And we had none of those things. We didn't have political power, not till the 300s or 400s at the earliest. Uh, Christianity did not have a single charismatic leader. You might think, well, what about Jesus? But remember, the actual spread of Christianity was after Jesus was gone. And we all agree, and, and remember, everybody agrees Jesus was gone. Some people think he was dead and gone. Some people think he was risen and gone. But everybody thinks he was gone. And when Jesus was here, it didn't spread like wildfire. Jesus had like four or 500 followers. It was a small little Jewish thing going on there. But, but after he was gone, uh, maybe you're thinking, well, wasn't Paul the central charismatic leader? Well, it might seem that way because when we read uh, the Bible, we only learn about how Christianity was spreading in the Pauline region, Turkey, Greece, and Rome. But at the same time that Paul was doing that ministry work, Christianity was pretty busy spreading to Persia, and Paul never went to Persia. It was pretty sp spreading to Ethiopia, and Paul never went to Ethiopia. It was spreading across North Africa, and Paul never went there. Christianity did not have a charismatic leader. They weren't flocking to be with Paul. They were flocking because they thought somebody rose from the dead. Never, nothing like that ever happened before. Third thing, everybody agrees. Everybody agrees this happened, is that none of the early leaders of this historical phenomena, none of them derived any material benefit from being the founders of this movement. Uh, the philosopher Pascal writes, uh, and he, this gets translated lots of different ways, so you've probably heard it other ways, but he writes this thing, I believe witnesses who bleed. I've always liked that line. What he means is, if your testimony to some truth makes you rich and you powerful, I'm likely to think that you're lying. But if your testimony, in fact, does you harm, if it's not in your own interest, well, I might believe you. And, and this is true of the early Christian leaders. And again, this is in sharp contrast to other religious movements where the founders of other religious movements, almost, again, you just look movement after movement, look at uh, Mormonism, look at uh, Islam, look at all these movements you can look at where the founders of those religious movements got wealth and power and for some bizarre reason, in almost every case, they also got lots of women. So this is a, a, a trend in a lot of religious movements that the leader ends up with lots of women. Well, not so in Christianity. The people who led the early Christian movement, they got stoned to death. They got beaten. And yet they persisted in insisting that they saw a guy rise from the dead. That has to be explained somehow. Again, with Keller, I get it. If you think the resurrection explanation is just too impossible to believe, I'm sympathetic. But some explanation must be made for these historical events no one disputes. Uh, fourth thing that nobody argues about is everybody agrees that during this same period, a group of spiritual writings emerged that all centered on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All, for all of them, their main point was Jesus rose from the dead. It, 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 we, we probably don't notice how significant that is about this writing. But if you look at other collections of spiritual writings, even look at the Old Testament, and how from one book to another, they'll focus on very different parts of the Jewish faith. But in the New Testament, there is not a single book that doesn't take as its cornerstone that Jesus rose from the dead. Every, n not a single book in the whole New Testament makes any sense 
has any theological meaning if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. The, the other thing about these writings that's so remarkable, and you've, again, we can, we can respectfully disagree on why this happened, but the truth of the writings, everybody agrees on this, that they all told stories about the resurrection that are hard to imagine a person would make up. So, for instance, they all told stories of women as the key witnesses to the resurrected Lord. Well, in the Jewish world and the Greek world and the Roman world, the testimony of women was not allowed in courts, and in general, women were thought to be more likely to be dishonest, especially about emotional matters. Well, so if these writings emerged to justify their faith, why would they ever have listed women as the first witnesses? Even if it was true, why not just leave it out and focus on where Peter met them? It, it, really, I think historically, the most reasonable explanation is, is that the stories didn't emerge to justify their faith, but rather that their faith emerged based on these stories. And again, skeptic, I understand if you want to say, okay, there's got to be some other explanation because people don't rise from the dead. I get it, but tell me, what is the other explanation? What might it be? We could say more about these writings if I had more time. There's a lot about them that is just remarkable and it limits our ability to come up with alternative explanations for their existence. The last thing I would say that is just remarkable and this sort of goes back to the first one about worldview, but it speaks to the specificity of the claims that were made about Jesus. And that is this, that even after a gruesome public crucifixion where he was stripped and beaten in front of everyone, there was a group of faithful Jews who persisted in claiming that that man was the Messiah, the anointed Savior of God. And then, in remarkably short order, our best evidence is within two or three years, even the biggest skeptic would say within ten years, they not only insisted, insisted he was the Messiah, they began to insist that he was the Son of God. See, here's the thing. Potential Messiahs were rising up all the time in Judaism. And they'd gather a few hundred followers, just like Jesus did. And they'd cause a little trouble, just like Jesus did. The Romans or the Jewish officials would kill them, just like they did to Jesus. And then they disappeared. And their followers scattered. Sometimes they'd go find a new Messiah. Sometimes they'd just go back to fishing. But the one thing they didn't do was insist that they were still the Messiah even after everyone watched them die. N.T. Wright puts it this way. This isn't a direct quote. If you want to read the direct quote for yourself, it's somewhere between page 1 and page 400. I forget exactly where. But he says something like this. He says this. It is, no, it is not just that it would have been the height of heresy to say that that crucified, naked, bleeding, disgusting man was the Messiah, the anointed one of God. And heresy beyond even imagination to say that crucified, naked, bleeding man was the, in fact the incarnate Son of God. It's not just that it would be heresy, he says. It's that it would be gross. It would be nasty to imagine God with a fleshy son who would then be so embarrassed and humiliated in such a way. It would just be so repugnant to the Jewish mind. And yet this is exactly the claim that emerged almost immediately. You'll notice in the text it describes after Jesus' death, they went back to fishing, right? You remember reading that resurrection story? And it, sometimes I, I used to read that and think, how could they go back to fishing? Didn't they have faith? But, but now I read this, I was like, oh no, that was what you were supposed to do when your Messiah got killed. You're like, oh man, he wasn't the Messiah. The, 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 the thing I should be shocked at isn't that they went back to fishing. It's that they didn't keep fishing. And again, we, we're looking for, we've got historical realities that demand explanations, and the historical reality that demands explanations is why in the world didn't Jesus' followers just go back to fishing? And why instead did they begin to make this repugnant, gross claim that that naked, bleeding man was the anointed Savior of God? 
Not just that, he was the son of God. God incarnate, God in the flesh. What could have made them do that? Okay, there are more things we could look at. Everybody agrees. Again, just to be clear, nobody's arguing that they didn't claim he was the Messiah even after he died. Every, the stuff I've just talked about, every historian I know of, most skeptical to the most faithful, thinks all those things happened. So, how do we explain it? I want to just run quickly through some explanations. Uh, I am going to go ahead and tell you why these explanations aren't persuasive to me, but I don't mean to mock them, and I know that for the sake of time, I'm going to have to give them very efficiently. So if you feel like, I don't know, maybe that is, that could be, what I would encourage you to do is just go study it. I promise you, I spent a lot of my life studying the alternative explanations for the historical facts we just discussed. Because I, like you, I know that by and large, dead people stay dead. And so I was hungry for a different explanation to these set of facts for a lot of my life. Here are some of the potentials. One is the theory that Jesus didn't really die. He passed out. He went into a unconscious or a coma from the abuse of the Romans. The Romans, not realizing that he was passed out, took him down off the cross and laid him in a tomb. Some days later, uh, he woke up in his weakened, dehydrated state, still managed to move by himself a half-ton rock, okay? You start to hear my skepticism flowing out here anyways, but he got up. He, he made it to where the disciples were. He was met by them on the road. In their shock of seeing the one they thought was dead still alive, they began to believe that he had truly experienced resurrection. Sometime after that, he disappears. Perhaps he dies of wounds after several days, or maybe he goes back to Galilee and hides out as a farmer or something, but he's gone. And the story lives on that Jesus briefly rose from the dead. Uh, that this, this theory does answer some of our questions, some of the evidence that we gathered. It would answer some of that. There are some weaknesses to it, though, that seem to me pretty severe. One is it depends, for, as its start, on a great work of historical condescension. It depends on the assumption that the Romans didn't know how to kill people. And I just say, that is just crazy. The Romans knew perfectly well how to kill people. In fact, the Romans were remarkably good at kill people. It was like the thing. Like, what are Romans good for? Aqueducts, that's for sure. Oh, and killing people. Okay, I mean, they were good at killing people. The other problem with it, and this really is the one that's more severe, because you could say, I know they were generally good at killing people, but this one time they messed up. Okay. The other problem with it, though, is, imagine this is true. Beaten within an inch of his life, flogged, made to carry the cross, hung on a cross all day long to the point where he passes out, his legs broken with a spear, stabbed in the side, dumped in a tomb, but he somehow doesn't die. Imagine what he would have looked like when they found him. He would have not looked like someone resurrected with a new and glorious body. He would not have been walking through walls and eating cooking fish on the beach. They would not, if they had seen him, now would they have thought it was a miracle? Yes. They would have said, it's a miracle. Jesus is still alive. But they would not have thought it's a miracle. Jesus is resurrected back from the dead. They wouldn't have changed their worldview. They would have just been grateful that the Romans messed up this one time. And so for me at least, the swoon theory fails to account for a group of people who totally changed what they believe and believed it so much they were willing to die for it. Oh, I forgot to tell you, this theory is called the swoon theory because swoon is an old-fashioned word for passing out. So like, ah, so Jesus, it's an old-fashioned, anyway, sorry. Moving on. The second theory that is, has been popular throughout uh, history uh, with skeptics is uh, that what we're dealing with is an organized conspiracy of dishonesty. They made it up. And for this, just for the sake of argument, let's assume goodwill. I'm not saying they made it up out of meanness. They just so wanted it to be true. They so wanted Jesus to not die. They just made up the fact that he did. And they just said, you know, they got together. Let's all just pretend that he's not dead so that there's still hope in the world. Well, as tempting as this is, and this actually, this was my theory when I was a teenager. This was it. They made it all up. 
As tempting as that theory is, it, it, it doesn't make any sense, actually, of any of the facts we've concocted. First of all, why would they think making up such a theory would give hope to the world? No one else had ever thought of, no one was waiting for there to be a resurrected Lord. Nobody was looking for a son of God. This isn't the thing that would give hope to the world. Uh, ad additionally, why would you make up a thing to give hope to the world that causes you and all the people you know to not experience hope, but instead experience brutal persecution for the rest of your life? Is it reasonable to think that 500 people got together and said, so that the people of Johnson City 2,000 years from now can have some sense of eternal hope, we're going to suffer our entire lives for a thing we know to be a lie. A lie so ridiculous there's no reason to think it will catch on? I think it's not reasonable to think. I think, and of course, that doesn't take into account the fact that if they had told such a lie, all somebody would have to do is just go produce the body. Another theory that has been popped through throughout the years, similar to the lie theory, but even nicer on the early disciples, is that what they experienced was a spiritually induced mass hallucination. They didn't actually see Jesus. They just so wanted to see Jesus, they convinced themselves that they saw Jesus. Again, again I'm just gonna be clear. I know I'm, I'm going over this fast. I'm not trying to mock these theories. The reason these theories sound so far-fetched is there is no simple explanation of the set of facts I just presented to you. And, and I know hallucination sounds far-fetched, but to a non-believer, you want to know what theory sounds far-fetched? Resurrection sounds far-fetched. There isn't a not far-fetched theory. But let's talk about hallucination. The hallucination theory uh, says this, that out of a sense of great spiritual hopefulness, they wanted so much to be true that they had a vision it was true. And, and, and many of us know of people who in the midst of great grief have had a vision of a deceased loved one. So the thought that one or two people might have had such a vision if they love Jesus deeply, that actually doesn't strike me as all that far-fetched at all. But the hallucination theory falls on several problems. One is it falls on the problem of the empty tomb. Jewish bodies weren't buried like our bodies were. I've had somebody ask me, why is this empty tomb thing such a big deal? Jewish bodies weren't buried six feet in the ground like ours were, where it was really hard to recover a body. They were put in tombs where you had easy access to the body. It was rel and so the body was just there. So if, if they'd had a hallucination without the lying conspiracy, they would have just taken the person. I, I think Jesus is still alive. You could have just walked them down and said, no, look, there his body is, right there. This is why the empty tomb is so important. Now, of course, you could say they hid the body. Well, that goes back to the lie theory, and we already talked about why that one doesn't seem to answer all our questions. The other problem with the hallucination theory is the hallucination theory depends on a conversation something like this happening. Uh, you've been a part of conversations like this. Um, I remember a conversation like this at the passing of my grandmother. I was sitting around with some of my family who loved her very dearly with the, you know, the kind of intense love that we really hope for in our families, you know. And this, isn't, th this conversation exactly didn't happen. This is a hypothetical example, but you'll follow me. You can imagine someone in a moment like that saying, you know, I tell you, I really, I woke up this morning I couldn't even bring myself to believe grandma was really gone. It just felt like I could just pick up the phone and call her. And then somebody else says, you know, I don't just what you mean. Yesterday I was shopping all day long. It felt like she was with me the whole day. It just felt like she was right there with me, commenting on, you know, why she didn't like my clothes, you know, the whole time, you know. And somebody else will say, oh my goodness, I had the same experience. Yesterday I was making biscuits, her, just the way she made biscuits, and I could almost hear her voice tell me I'd put in too much flour. She always thought I put in too much flour. I could hear her voice in my ear telling me there was too much flour. Up till there, we can all imagine that conversation. We've all been a part of that, conversations like that. But then imagine a fourth person said, I know just what you're talking about. In fact, I'm convinced Grandma is still alive. I think the reason you're having these experiences is that she came back from the dead and she's now alive and she'll soon come be with us and we'll see her in bodily form. Once again, she isn't really dead. I think when you imagine it like that, you can see that that is when the conversation would stop. No one would nod along after that. Someone would say, oh, sweetie, I'm so sorry. 
I know why you want that to be true. We all want that to be true. But grandma's gone. And maybe we'd talk about our hope for heaven if we believed in the resurrection, but we wouldn't let them persist in that confusion, would we? And, and that's what we have to believe to believe the hallucination theory. That somehow wishful thinking and that beautiful sense that God gives us that our loved one is still with us, that somehow that got carried away into these very concrete, very specific claims of encounters with the risen Lord. And they believed these claims so strongly that they died for them. And that there wasn't a tomb that could be checked to produce the body. For me, that one isn't very persuasive either. Two more theories. One very popular in recent uh, skeptical scholarship is this. That the stories of Jesus' resurrection are legends that developed later to explain their theological beliefs. Well, there's one big problem with this theory. Because you remember when we were listing our historical facts? Half of the historical facts we couldn't explain were the theological beliefs. So, okay, if the stories of the resurrection are legends designed to explain the theological beliefs, then you've got to have some other answer for where did the theological beliefs come from? If it wasn't the risen Lord walking among them that made them say he really was the Messiah, the Son of God, then where in the world else did they get that crazy idea? If it wasn't the resurrected Lord walking among them that made them completely shift their worldview from one that was rooted in future hope to one that was rooted in the present reality of the resurrection, where in the world did they get that idea? The biggest problem with the legend theory is just from the face of it, it simply ex doesn't explain most of our questions. It's the most tempting theory out there today. We're prone to put Christian, Christian truth in the same bucket as every other religion. But it just doesn't work because it actually doesn't answer our historical questions. The other problem with the legend theory is just this, just real simply, there's just not enough time. Uh, the text we're talking about, 1 Corinthians, the latest anybody thinks that was written was in like 55 or something, which is like 20 years after Jesus died. 20 years is just not enough time for a, a legend to get concocted. If I told you that I know eyewitnesses who didn't see planes, but instead saw the physical hand of God come out of the sky and smash the towers to the ground, you would not think I had come up with some interesting spiritual truth you would think I was crazy or cruel because we all know how the towers fell because we watched it happen with our very eyes. And even if TV hadn't been invented back then, I know three people, three live actual people who saw it with their own eyes, not through television. So we couldn't make up a legend 15 years later about how the towers fell. Maybe in 100 years there'll be a legend, but not 15 and that's the timeline we're talking about here. One last theory. One last theory. The only other theory I can think of that could possibly explain the historical data we have on which no one disagrees is this. There might have been a guy sometime around 28, 29 who began to teach about the kingdom of God in a way nobody had ever heard before. People began to follow him some even thought he was the Messiah. Eventually, as often happens, the government turned on him and they had him publicly and humiliatingly crucified. And it was a successful crucifixion. He was good and dead. And his followers knew it and they buried him in a tomb to come back later and anoint oil on him. And they did that. Three days later, they went back to the tomb with spices and perfumes to anoint the body so that it could decay in peace. And when they got there, the tomb was empty. And they turned around, and there was someone they didn't recognize at first, but when they looked a second time, they could see it was that very man. Their very rabbi was now alive. 
And they ran back to tell others. And while the women ran back, the rabbi appeared walking on the side of the road with two men on their way to Emmaus. And he went to their house and he broke bread. And after he broke bread, he disappeared. And that was a little odd for a man to just disappear right in front of them. But they knew it wasn't a hallucination because the bread sat there in two pieces. So something real had happened. And then he walked through a door. And that's a little weird. People don't walk through doors very often. But then he asked his disciples to touch his hands and feel his side and later he ate breakfast with them and for 40 days he stayed with them so they would know that the one who was once dead and in the grave was now truly and completely and mysteriously but yet really and historically alive. That would also explain it. So if you have skeptical friends, honor their skepticism. I get it. If you told me if some friend of yours died and came back from the dead, I wouldn't believe you either. Honor their skepticism. But invite them to ask the question, if not the truly resurrected Lord, what else could explain what we have seen happen in our God's world? Let's pray. God, we thank you for Jesus Christ who did not just bring us truth but brought us reality. Who did not just bring us hope but brought us history. His own flesh risen from the dead that we might believe and we might trust and may we by your grace be ready to give the answer for the faith as it was in us. In the name of our truly resurrected Lord we pray. Amen. Church, I invite you to stand as we sing together our gratitude and our confidence in our risen Lord. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Sing those words with us once again. Because he lives, I If today you need to make a decision to trust in the risen Lord, I hope that after this service you would come up and meet with us. We'll be here and ready to pray with you and ask, just let you begin to live a life trusting in Christ's resurrection. And for all of us, I pray that as you go out, you would be the ambassadors of the truth that Jesus Christ in history is alive. Praise God. Have a great week, church.